bem-vindas ao nosso Congresso Internacional, The Role of International Organizations in International Law. Uh, o meu nome é Lucas Lima e, em respeito aos nossos convidados, a gente vai fazer a sessão toda hoje em inglês, de maneira que eu imediatamente passo a nossa língua de trabalho. Uh, for me, it's a great honor to re receive very important guests for this journey discussing the law of international organizations from different perspectives. Um, this morning, we are going to discuss with Professor Jan Klabers and Professor Jorge Galindo the future, or, or better, the law of international organizations and the immunities of international organizations. In the afternoon, Professor Michele Raton and Professor Fabio Morosini will discuss a very hot topic that is the future and the current design of the system of the World Trade Organization. And in the end of the afternoon, Professor Luis Alerão and I will discuss the role of one specific organ of an international organization in the formation of international law, that is the International Law Commission. The purpose of this uh, event is to recreate and these discussions about the international organization in Brazil. The topic has not been very much explored except for some specific and very important works and the UFMG has once, once again to discuss and to reflect upon what's happening on the field. Uh, before giving the floor to our very important guests and I have to thank you very much Professor Klabers for coming directly from Finland uh, after a curious flight that give her give him the opinion the, the, the opportunity to visit Santiago and Buenos Aires in the same uh, afternoon uh, I would like also like to thank Professor Galindo Professor Michele Raton Professor Morosini and Professor Luisa Leão but to my happiness I will give the floor to Professor Aziz Saliba the Dean of International Relations of our University a very good colleague a good friend uh, we have many projects on international law here in the faculty, many study groups, and you are going to see some of the results of these projects in the coming year. For me, it's a great joy to organize this event with him, and he is going to greet our guests in the name of the university, Professor Aziz Saliba. Well, thank you very much, Professor Lucas Lima. I would like, on behalf of the university president, to extend a warm welcome to Professor Jan, Jan Glabers, to Professor Jorge Galindo, to Professor Luisa Leão, Professor Fava Morzini, Professor Michele Raton. Uh, I have learned uh, as, a, as a speaker, but mainly as uh, in, in the current role, that uh, a few things about opening ceremonies. One of them is that people are not here to listen to long uh, opening uh, speeches. They're rather here to listen to Professor Galindo and to Professor Klabers this morning and to uh, Luisa, um, Fabio, and Michelle in the afternoon. So I'll be extremely brief. I just would like to, first of all, congratulate Professor Lucas Lima for all the work uh, in, for putting together this excellent event. Uh, this is important to me, not only uh, as a dean for international affairs, but uh, especially as uh, Professor Lima's uh, collaborator, as a, as a member of this law school, and as someone who is very much interested in international law. Uh, it's a chance to see some good old friends that I had not seen for a while. Uh, and it's also a chance of listening to a person who has very much contributed to my formation as an international lawyer. Uh, and I have to say, Professor Jan Klabers, that your text on treaties and on, interna on international organizations were very important to me as a student, and uh, it's a great honor to be listening to you this morning. So without further ado, I would like to once again welcome my friends who are here, and also welcome Professor Jan Klabers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aziz. Just a small note before giving the floor to Professor Klabers. I would like to thank all the students involved in this organization, the members of the group Stilus Curiarum, and especially Sara Tonani that helped in several parts of the project and organization. Thank you very much, Sara, and thank you very much, the team, for helping us to make this event possible. 
Professor Klaber needs no introduction. You received a lot of emails telling about him and inviting you to this conference. So is, I give him the floor to tell us about rethinking the law of international organization. Thank you very much, Professor Klaber. Thank you, everyone. For Does this work? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I lost my voice a few weeks ago, so I'm a little bit uncertain as to whether anyone can hear me to begin with. Can you hear me in the back? Or should I put it closer? No? It's okay? Maybe a little bit closer, yeah. Maybe a little bit closer still. Maybe a little bit closer still. Okay. That works. I uh, gave this talk the somewhat immodest title, Rethinking the Law of International Organizations, partly because I didn't know what else to call it, partly because that is what it is. Some bits and pieces might sound familiar to some of you. I've been talking about them before. I may have written about some of the stuff before. A friend of mine this morning suggested I should give it the subtitle, Rethinking Through Recycling, hmm. and that was pretty accurate, I guess. So just that you know. The first question, of course, when you talk about rethinking the law of international organizations would be why? Why is that even necessary? Doesn't it work perfectly fine, or at least adequately? And yes, it does. And the science of muddling through is uh, visible in full force when it comes to the law of international organizations. They keep being set up, they keep working more or less as anticipated, and the same problems keep coming back and back. I think there are two reasons still to think about rethinking in the law of international organizations. One of them is that there is a bunch of um, practical issues that the law just has a very difficult time handling. You may remember in 2010, earthquake occurring in Haiti. The UN had a small mission there, expected increased unrest, so it enlarged its mission, but with a bunch of peacekeepers from Nepal who ended up bringing cholera to the island. 8,000 people or thereabouts lost their lives. And we don't know how to handle that. This is clearly a case of something nasty or something problematic happening on an international organization's watch during the presence and related to the presence of an international organization somewhere. And yet the law does not seem to have any clue what to do with that. The obvious has been attempted Relatives of the victims have gone to court in New York, the Southern District Court of New York, where uh, the UN is headquartered, have tried to bring a case against the UN. And very predictably, the UN invoked absolute immunity, something Professor Galindo might be talking about more. And the court accepted that without further ado. And beyond that, nothing much has happened. And that's somehow not right, right? It, um, it leaves a strange afterthought. Two weeks ago, different story, but same problem. I was in Geneva, where, as you may have heard, there are negotiations going on to conclude a pandemic treaty. And the big question there at the World Health Organization seems to be whether that agreement should be in the form of an independent treaty or should be in the form of international health regulations which is a legal instrument that can be adopted by the World Health Organization and then becomes binding on all states, member states of the World Health Organization unless they explicitly opt out. I was talking to the diplomats who are negotiating that and the question that kept coming back, which is surprising since the World Health Organization has been in existence since 1948, is what exactly is the legal status of the international health regulations? Are they binding? Are they not binding? Are they something in between? Uh, are they a treaty in disguise or are they a separate standing instrument? We don't know after, what is it, 60 years, 70, 80 years, I think, of World Health Organization, we don't have a clue. And what applies to the World Health Organization applies to all sorts of other organizations as well. We don't know what to do when things go wrong. We don't know what to make of their normative output so at the very least, there are issues of explanation involved. And the academic in me thinks, you know, we need to be able to explain things, not just to apply the law as it stands in particular treaties or other instruments and then, you know, cross our fingers and hope for the best. 
but academically it would also be nice if we can sometimes explain things. So that's a couple of practical issues where the law of international organization just is not particularly helpful. And then there are more structural issues, in particular perhaps the issue of accountability. We don't really know how that works. We've had various initiatives since the 1980s when the International Tin Council in London collapsed, when um, the, the creditors went to court saying, can't we go and chase the member states for our money? And the court said no, because international organizations have their separate personality, their separate identity. You cannot blame Italy and Denmark for what went wrong through the behavior of the International Tin Council. Since then, we've had a half a dozen very serious attempts to come up with some kind of accountability regime. We've had dozens of less serious, or uh, how shall I put this delicately, sometimes nonsensical attempts to do this, and nothing seems to work. And then the question is, why doesn't anything se seem to work? Is that because we just should think harder and deeper and more seriously? Or is there something more structural going on? I tend to think there's something more structural going on. And we'll get to that in a moment. Now, if you think that the law should be rethought, reconsidered, then the first impulses that any international lawyer usually has are two, and in this order. The first impulse is always, something doesn't work, we need more rules. This is what happened with the accountability. We needed the global administrative law, perhaps, or the recommended rules and practices of the International Law Association, or Rosalind Higgins' resolution at the Institut de Droit International, or then the Articles on Responsibility coming out of the ILC, the International Law Commission. None of that worked. So now we are on to stage two. This is the second knee jerk. If new rules are not happening, we need more tribunals. The ILC has taken that project on recently under a slightly different name of dispute settlement involving international organizations, something big, grand, and open-ended like that. And it's very easy to predict, despite the not inconsiderable competences of the special rapporteur on the topic, Professor Reinisch from Vienna, it's not that easy to predict that this won't work either, because the problem, as I will tell you later on, is much deeper than just not having the right rules or the right tribunals in place. I think the system cannot handle accountability issues. That's one thing it cannot handle. I'll focus a little bit on that. In computer terms, you might have the nicest software but if it's not compatible with the computer's operating system, you won't get anywhere. The RDO, the Articles on Responsibility of International Organizations, represent very nice software indeed, but are incompatible with the operating system of international organizations law. So hold that image in mind. I'll get back to the story. Let's start with a little history, because I think part of the problem is that we have been wrong-footed in our thinking about international organizations right from the start. Uh, some people placed the start in 1815, when the Rhine Commission was established in Europe after Napoleon was defeated at Waterloo. Uh, a couple of the riparian states set up the Rhine Commission um, with a view to regulating navigation on the Rhine, with a view to regulating trade on the Rhine, where could traders embark and disembark their products? Who could exercise toll rights along the river? At some point there were 560 communities that all had their toll regimes. You can imagine, even if the Rhine is a sizable river, that that becomes quite burdensome if you're a trader. The Rhine also was not a naturally nice flowing river. It needed to be tamed, as it was called. And all that was the work of the Rhine Commission a bunch of people representing their member states and doing something for whom, actually. The traditional story of international organizations said they were doing this for the common good. And in some ways, that is, of course, very obviously the case. But if you dig a little deeper, the common good was mostly the common good of facilitating trade and commerce on the river, making the river easier to navigate 
making it easier to handle, uh, streamlining the toll rights, streamlining the embarkment and disembarkment rights, and thus making it so much easier for the riparian states to do business together, facilitating trade and commerce. That has a link to the global good, no doubt. Immanuel Kant wrote about that about 20 years before the Rhine Commission was set up, and it's not impossible that his eternal peace was an inspiration to those who drafted the Rhine Commission uh, treaties. But maybe I give him too much credit now. That's also possible. Um, so this was the Rhine Commission set up not only for the common goods, but also for particular goods, for the goods of traders, of facilitating business and commerce and all that. And when I say that, I don't necessarily mean that in a pejorative way. It's not that difficult to see that uh, some of the states who have practiced uh, decent trade relations over the centuries are pretty well off these days maybe as a consequence. So I have no particular normative agenda when I say that. Not against big capital or something, mm -hmm. or like a Marxist agenda. That's uh, far from my mind. You see the same pattern emerging in the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. And again, that's no coincidence. The first, some people say, if you don't count the Rhine Commission and the Danube Commission, the first proper international organization was the International Telegraphic Union, set up in 1865. And that is no coincidence. It was set up once it had become possible to send telegraphic messages around the world. You needed cables for that. And of course, if you need to do it across the world, you need cables on the seabed. Otherwise, you can't do it across the world, at least not in those days. So you need some entity to take care of regulating and managing those cables, make sure that no one cuts them in the middle of the night, and make sure that a bunch of things are harmonized. What kind of telegraph language to use, for instance? If you've ever watched old Western movies with John Wayne, you know that Morse code was the victor there. But Morse code became the victor because the convention, the telegraphic convention of 1865 said, we shall adopt Morse language as the one standard communication tool for telegraphic messages. The ITU still exists. It changed its name in 1937, I think, to International Telecommunication Union. And of course, the telegraph is no longer in use, as far as I'm aware. Not much, at any rate. It only survives in messages sent from ships in distress, the SOS message, where, again, Morse code is the language in use. This was followed a few years later by the Universal Postal Union, which our good friend Donald Trump wanted to leave a few years ago. I might get back to that story, it's a good story. Um, he didn't in the end. The Universal Postal Union was a response inspired by the United States and Germany and France to um, the enormous mess that postage entailed in the 1860s. It was set up in 1874. The idea came from the US Postmaster General in 1862, a certain Mr. Montgomery Blair. Postmaster General in the US is a serious position, right? That's like the government minister for postal stuff. Probably a bit more sophisticated than stuff, but that's a cabinet function. Um, and Montgomery Blair, had figured out that if he would, in his capacity as postmaster general, oversee the sending of a letter from, say, Seattle to Frankfurt, it could take no less than 1,200 different ways of getting there, different in terms of routes, different in terms of rates, different in terms of size requirements, different in terms of maximum weight requirements, different in terms of uh, the time it would take to get there, 1,200 different ways. What do you think this, how do you think that works out for international trade and commerce? If you make an offer by letter to a counterpart somewhere in a different country, and you have no idea when it arrives, whether it arrives, uh, and whether or not it will be accepted, uh, or has been accepted, 
because it could still be in the mail somewhere, maybe going from Frankfurt via Syracuse to, uh, to Seattle or something. Not a good idea. So the Postal Convention was concluded with a view to harmonizing all that. Maybe I'll get to Trump later. Not yet. Um, in the 1890s, the Europeans, in particular in Western Europe, it was found out that it's a bit cumbersome if the railroads in France do not nicely connect to the railroads in Germany or Belgium. They have different width, gorgeous, I think it's called. They have different rules as to how much maximum tonnage can be. So again, in order to harmonize things, an international organization was set up. It's known under its French acronym, OTIF, Organisation pour le transport de something something international chemin de fer. <laughs> OTIF, International Organization for Carriage of Goods by Railway, I think, in English. But I always mix the title up. But again, the point is, this was not for world peace per se. This was not to do a global common good. This was to harmonize for the purpose of trade and commerce. And again, nothing wrong with that. But it just it puts the mind in a slightly different direction. And around the same time, my personal favorite was set up in Paris, the Bureau International de Poids et Mesures, the International Bureau for Weights and Measures. Because clearly, it would be very useful if a meter, probably something like this, would be the same size in Holland, Denmark, and Brazil, right? So if you would buy a piece of cloth of 10 meters from Brazil, it would have the same length as 10 meters cloth bought from Denmark and not be longer or shorter according to local custom. Like the original practice in the clothing industry was to measure the length from the middle finger to the elbow. But of course, some people have longer arms than others. Mm. Some people have shorter arms than others. So you don't get a very harmonized system. The same with weights. I've been told, I have yet to see this in person, but I've been told that at headquarters of the Bureau International de Poids et Mesures, there is a replica of something weighing exactly one kilo, covered by a glass thing to prevent dust from speckling down. Because you can imagine, if it attracts dust, it is no longer exactly one kilo. So you need to keep that original model in place and protect it at all costs so that you can always go back in doubt, is this a kilo or is it 999.99 grams or whatever. So all those international organizations set up not so much, and this is 40 years worth of international organizations, not so much to help us achieve the salvation of mankind as uh, common doctrine seems to have it, but rather to stimulate trade and commerce. And at the end of the day, that might then result in global peace and eternal peace and all that. But they were never set up with that solely in mind. Indeed, some were set up for more pedestrian purposes when Europe in the mid-19th century became the victim of contagious diseases coming from Asia in particular and from Africa, we saw the creation of sanitary offices in strategic locations like Alexandria in Egypt, Tangier in Morocco, Tehran in Iran, Constantinople in Turkey, creating a cordon sanitaire, if you will, around Europe. In the Americas, something similar in 1902 with the Pan American Health Office, which still exists, set up not at the outer edges of the US, but clearly to prevent the US from being victim of contagious diseases coming from the southern part of the Americas. So that has fairly little to do with the universal common good. That's a very specific common good, the health of Europeans, the health of North Americans that was at stake. And a nice story is also the creation of the International Copyright Union. It's already difficult to see a connection between copyright and global peace, right? Mm -hmm. So there is that to consider. The International Copyright Union was the brainchild, in a way, of Victor Hugo, 
a novelist whom you may have heard of, Les Miserables, Hunchback of Notre Dame. Um, he would write pieces on commission of French newspapers, would get paid a token sum for each piece, say 300 francs or something. And after that, everyone could take the piece and reproduce it because he had been paid after all. Everyone could take the piece, photocopy, well, not photocopy, that was a later technology, but reproduce it. They could translate it into English, as happened frequently, into Portuguese, perhaps, maybe less frequently, into Spanish, and the translators would get paid, but not Victor Hugo. So he got a bit upset, shall we say, to put it nicely. He was president at the time of the Association Association Littéraire et Artistique Internationale, an interest group of artists and literary uh, workers. And in that capacity, he started to lobby the French government, first for a copyright convention, harmonizing the idea that everyone should have the same uh, types of benefits, and that then automatically, or almost automatically, became institutionalized in the form of the International Copyright Union. And if you say, well, I've never heard of that, that surely doesn't exist anymore. It does, but in a different form, under a different name. It has been subsumed as part of the World Intellectual Property Organization. This was again late 19th century. And again, showing that international organizations owe much of their raison d'etre, not to any grand ideals, although that's not excluded but often to very mundane considerations. One of the consequences was that, um, of the copyright union was that composers like Giuseppe Verdi became the first who did not have to teach piano or violin lessons anymore to reluctant teenagers, but could live off their operas. Uh, something good came out of that, perhaps, but th that's beside the point. Um, the point is, they were all set up, all those organizations, not for lofty goals, but for market reasons, if you will, helping states to achieve prosperity. And states had started to realize that that was useful because they had started to realize that states lead legitimacy to exercise authority over their subjects. Uh, since Hobbes, we all agreed that that would come from providing security but in the 19th century, the trading state came up and authorities started to think, ooh, we can also maybe tell the people that they should respect our laws and regulations if we make them economically better off, if we guarantee prosperity. Now, you can do that internally, domestically, if you have a big enough market. But for many states, especially in Europe, the markets tend to be rather small. So what better way of doing that than joining forces on the basis of trading theories like David Ricardo's, which go back to the same era. So idealism had fairly little to do with this. Uh, international organizations were also not set up to speak power, speak law to power, as the argument sometimes goes, to tell states how to behave properly. They may do that sometimes. UNHCR tells states not to ignore its refugee law obligations, that sort of thing but they were rather set up as extensions of states, as administrative agencies for states. Don't, don't get me on the terminology, it's, it's a bit, uh, like the role of language is always problematic, but something along those lines, as administrative extensions of states, rather than as independent harbingers of world peace who would turn swords into plowshares. And the best illustration thereof, perhaps, is a story uh, coming from the year 1906 and involving the founding father of international organizations law, Paul Reinsch, who was teaching international relations at the University of Madison in Wisconsin, was a, a member of the US delegation to uh, several of the meetings, uh, the annual meetings of the Union of American Republics, as I think it was still in those days. He gave a lecture in 1906 to the Milwaukee Bankers Club. In Milwaukee, city in Wisconsin. This was before the automobile was really popular, so my image is always that the bankers would go to the meeting place, 
in horse and carriage, wearing pinstripe, three-piece suits, having a dinner and after dinner, enjoying a nice glass of brandy and a big cigar, would listen to the talk by Professor Reinsch on the benefits of international organizations. So Reinsch, who was a strong advocate of international organizations, wrote a wonderful book in 1911, combining several of his earlier articles. Um, Reinsch does his usual talk saying, we should be joining international organizations, we should support them because they can only do good in the world and they cost us nothing, neither in terms of loss of sovereignty, which was of course a concern to some, still is to some, and not in financial cost either. Like he would give examples of US membership of the Copyright Union amounting to something like maybe $10,000 a year or so. And look at what it brings our authors, look at what it brings our artists. So he was a firm advocate. But after the talk, the Q&A. One of the bankers, maybe after a good glass of brandy, takes the floor, as Professor Reinsch, this was all very interesting. But wouldn't it just be a hell of a lot easier for us and a lot more transparent and clear if we would just invade Latin America instead of doing this through the Union of American Republics? And Reinsch's response was, yeah, well, that would probably work but it would not nearly be as effective nor as cost effective as doing it through the Union of American Republics. And the result, the same, US hegemony in the region, but at far bigger expense. That's a wonderful story, isn't it? Maybe not if you're from Brazil, I should say, <laughs> but uh, if you're safely from Holland, uh, it's, it's a good story to illustrate the lack of uh, idealism or the the big politics, the high politics involved as well. Now, so much for setting the tone. How then, strategic, dramatic sip of water, <laughs> how then to rethink international organizations law? I identify four steps that I think we should have a look at. Um, the first is that international organizations is a term which has two components, right? International and organization. If you go through the literature since the 1860s, very scarce at the time, but a bit more since the 1880s, you see that 99.99999% of it focuses on the international in international organization. At the obvious expense, of the organizational bit. We have forgotten, if we ever realized it, we as a discipline, we have forgotten that international organizations are not just international, but are also organizations and do typically what all organizations do. Whether it's uh, your local pizza parlor, whether it's a trade union, whether it's the University Federal of Minas Gerais, all organizations essentially do three things, maybe with different weights and emphasis, but three things. One is they regulate things. I'm sure this university has rules on how well you should have studied in order to pass your exams, or what kind of people can be appointed as junior professors or senior professors. There are rules for everything, uh, for a lot more things, but those are fairly obvious. Your local pizza parlor might have rules as to who can be hired as waiters or waitresses, uh, whether it should exclusively focus on thin crust or on deep crust pizzas. Um, all organizations do this, no matter what, no matter how. So they regulate. The second thing they do is they manage. They monitor and manage what they have just regulated. And the third thing is that in the course of regulating, they distribute costs and benefits. Think back to the start of the COVID pandemic. World Health Organization declares a public health emergency of international concern. Immediately, Jeff Bezos and Amazon get richer. And three weeks after that was declared, the first airline went bankrupt. Because obviously people stopped traveling and started to use parcel services far more. 
that was not at the core of the idea of the Director General of the World Health Organization when he made that declaration in, uh, what was it, February uh, 2020. But that was a very obvious effect. Something similar happened when the swine flu was declared in 2009, leading to some countries stop e stopping, what do you call that, de seizing and desisting the eating of pork meat, because swine flu, and started poultry consumption, which meant that some countries where the chicken industry was big became a lot more better off and others did not. And especially, of course, chicken companies, poultry companies gained a lot from that, as did the pharmaceutical companies whose vaccines were ready when the declaration was made. The vaccines, the, the pharmaceutical companies whose vaccines were not ready in 2009 were very critical of the World Health Organization having been too quick in declaring a pandemic, because obviously they lost a potential fortune. So organizations, all organizations, but also international organizations, they regulate things, they manage and monitoring them, manage and monitor them, and they distribute costs and benefits. If we have time, that also takes me to the Trump story again. Um, the second point, uh, this is something we should realize. You don't have to adopt this as the gospel, but we should realize that international organizations are not just manifestations of the international, not just manifestations of cooperation between states in goodwill and harmony and all that. They can be, but they are also organizations regulating, managing, distributing. Those costs and benefits, that's the second point, I think we should realize when we think of rethinking international organizations law. Those costs and benefits befall not so much member states. That's our usual conceit. And I just was guilty of it myself when I said countries whose poultry industry was big made a gain there. It's not the countries really. It is the companies within those countries. If Bayer, the pharmaceutical company from Leverkusen in Germany, has a nice decision going for it. It's Bayer that wins, not Germany. Germany might win in a more abstract sense. If the European University Institute in Florence, in Italy, which is also an international organization, by the way, if it accepts a Brazilian student for a PhD program, thereby bypassing a Swedish student, it's not a victory for Brazil. Maybe in a very abstract sense, it's a victory for that student, right? the cost and benefits go to that student and the Swedish student who does not get in, presuming there was a direct competition. That has always been the case. The ILO, the International Labour Organization, has made a lot of recommendation, a lot of conventions that are supposed to benefit workers. Maybe some that also benefit industries and employers, but not so much because they would benefit Nigeria but they typically don't, I guess, at any rate, or because they would benefit Denmark. No, they benefit individuals, you and me, one way or another. So we should drop that sort of state centrism, that state-centric perspective that international organizations are only there, only arenas where states hammer out their political differences. Sometimes that will be the case maybe in the Security Council. But there are 300 further international organizations where this way of thinking is not particularly helpful. That's the third point that we should realize. The universe of international organizations comprises more than five international organizations. What we typically do, and maybe we'll see that after the break as well, so, without prejudice to any further conversation on this. Typically, when we focus on international organizations, what do we focus on? We focus on the UN, because it's the biggest, and it's universal, both in terms of membership and in terms of jurisdiction. We focus on the EU, because it's the most advanced, perhaps, in some, by some way of reckoning. We focus on the WTO, because that had a constitutional moment at its creation. And then we focus at the IMF and the World Bank because they were very important economically, 
are very important economically. Those are the five we look at. And those are hopelessly unrepresentative of the genre. It's like you look at dolphins and whales and say, now I know everything about fish. <laughs> yeah. Whales are not even fish, technically, <laughs> just to make that point, <laughs> right? There's 300 or 400, what do I know? Depends how you count and what you include and exclude. But at least conservatively estimated, there's 300 international organizations in the world. And those five that we always look at are by no means representative. And that's problematic if you start to theorize on the basis of looking at the EU and then saying, well, this should apply to all organizations. It never will. It's just impossible. It's silly. It's uh, retrograde. I could think of nastier terms, but we don't do that. And if I do, it's the jet lag, right? <laughs> don't hold me accountable for that. A fourth step is to realize that international organizations are political actors. Because, precisely because they regulate, they monitor, manage, they distribute costs and benefits, they are as political as anything else. And we should get rid of the idea that they only exist for and through their member states. This is different from the state centrist I was pointing at earlier. We also have this tendency to think that the only legally relevant position that, uh, that we should look at is the relationship between international organizations and their member states. And that misses a lot. That misses the internal setting. It's no coincidence that, unless there's every now and then an incident, no one writes about internal affairs of international organizations, about relations between organs. Well, you did. <laughs> you have to defend that in two weeks, so <laughs> pay attention. No one writes about that. No one writes about relations between organs, uh, unless there is a case before the ICJ about judicial review, which then goes nowhere, like the Lockerbie case, mm -hmm. then for about a year, there were 20 people writing about judicial review, and then it completely fell flat again. And if we write about judicial review or relations between General Assembly and Security Council, or between Council and Commission in the EU, mm -hmm. or between plenary and executive in any other organization, we don't look at the law of international organizations. We look at public law analogies. We look at checks and balances theories. We look at separations of powers theories. Because the relation between the organization and its member states cannot tell us anything about how it should work internally. Also, this is why I was pointing to Sarah, in relations between organizations and their staff members. That doesn't get you anywhere to look only at what the member states may have in mind, because the member states would only say, well, the organization should function as we intended it and that puts the rights of the staff members completely on the back burner. So that's fairly, fairly useless. Plus, third legal dynamic, you have the one between organizations and its members, it's not unimportant, but it's not the whole story. You have second, the internal system, and third, you have the external position of international organizations. We just saw the ILO makes rules for workers, for employers, for industries. The, the World Health Organization tries to protect our health and has tried to do so already through its precursors in the 19th century. Well, the health of some was maybe more important than the health of others, but it was clearly not the health of nations per se that was at issue there. So we have those three legal dynamic, dynamics and the law should adapt to that because only then can we make the operating system suitable for the software that we develop with respect to accountability, for instance. Um, do I still have time for the Trump story? No. Because it's a, very, uh, it's a very illustrative story. And it's always nice to badmouth Trump, let's face it. <laughs> we might get four more years of that, which is not nice, but uh, that's a story for uh, maybe next year. In 2018, 
the American government, Trump was its president, tweeting his ass off from the White House. The American government discovered that the Universal Postal Union was not working to US advantage and announced that it would withdraw from the Universal Postal Union. And when I first heard that, my jaw dropped. Boom, right to the floor. Why on earth would anyone in their right mind wish to leave the Universal Postal Union? What do those guys do? Come on, how can that be objectionable? It could be, Trump had figured out, or rather Steve Bannon perhaps, or some other uh, suspicious advisor. It turned out that the Universal Postal Union sets its postal rates by taking the economic situation of member states into consideration. So the rates for parcels sent in the US and by US companies are higher than those for the same stuff sent by, say, China. So to put it colloquially, a parcel sent from Portland, Oregon to San Francisco would be more expensive than the same parcel sent from Shanghai to San Francisco. This now, Trump thought, this cannot be good for US business. We have to do something. So we withdraw from the Universal Postal Union because this works to the disadvantage of US business. Note, there was not a hint here of global peace and harmony and salvation of mankind. This was just bad for you as business. At which point, the minds of the directorate at the Universal Postal Union got concentrated. They convened an extraordinary uh, conference of the member states in October 2019, so before the US announcement of withdrawal would take effect. At which point those rates, they call them terminal dues, which it sounds a little morbid somehow. Um, so those rates were renegotiated in 2019, much to the satisfaction of the United States and its businesses, to the effect that President Trump could proudly announce that actually we're not leaving the Universal Postal Union. Who would want to do that? The venerable Universal Postal Union, which does so much good in the world. Story illustrates, like so many other stories, that international organizations are set up in a to a large measure to serve commercial interest, to serve the creation of markets, the maintenance of markets, success on markets. That may or may not be a normatively pretty sight. That's for everyone on their own to figure out. But at the very least, it should be realized when we start to think and rethink the law of international organizations, because otherwise we'll just get lost in this vicious eternal cycle. New rules, oh, it doesn't work. New tribunals, doesn't work. Ah, more new rules. Let's reform. No, more tribunals. And that will go on forever and ever and ever. To prevent me from going on forever and ever and ever, I'll stop here. Thank you. Professor Klabers for this insightful conference and I hope that you still have the interest to come in the afternoon to hear about the WTO and the UN. Uh, you should. <laughs> and uh, I would like also to thank Professor Klabers because he gave two of his books to our library in the afternoon so we will have access to the late edition of his handbook on international organization. But now I have the honor to give the floor to a good friend of the Faculty of Law, Professor Jorge Galindo from the University of Brasilia, a member of the uh, International Law Commission and also the advisor of the, uh, legal, uh, the Foreign Office. And he's going to talk about the immunity of international organizations through the lenses of the Brazilian practice. Thank you very much, Professor Galindo, to, to come this morning and this afternoon to be here with us. It's always a pleasure to have you here at the Faculty of Law. Thank you so much, Professor Lucas Lima. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here in Afonso uh, Pena's house. Uh, it sounds very strange, I mean, speaking in English, right? <laughs> but in any case, uh, thank you very much. I would like to say that uh, it's, uh, it's quite an honor to be here, not only because this is 
uh, one of the most important law schools in Brazil, but also to be again with uh, Professor Ian Klabris. I had the pleasure to meet him during uh, a stay of studies uh, in Helsinki. Uh, as a matter of fact, I had uh, the pleasure, I mean, to be his neighbor. I don't know if he remember yeah, yeah. this. <laughs> yes, and Professor Klabris is a very kind person, a wonderful scholar, uh, and I think it's, uh, it's going to be a very productive uh, week for you, but uh, even for those that will not uh, be uh, during his course, I mean, this is quite an opportunity to hear from, uh, I would say, maybe the most important expert in international organizations law currently. So, uh, well, I mean, my, ro my role here is a uh, uh, quite residual one, I would like just to uh, give some hints on, on Brazilian state practice regarding the immunities of international organizations. I will not be so comprehensive uh, and I won't be uh, so deep in terms of um, uh, trying to understand the role of international organizations in international law, not only through history but uh, nowadays. So my focus here is uh, quite, uh, is very specific. So uh, what I proposed uh, Professor Lucas Lima was to say some words about the practice, the state practice of uh, Brazil regarding the immunities of international organizations. Um, uh, maybe for some it will sound very strange I mean, speaking some very specific terms uh, of Brazilian procedural law in English, but in any case, I will try to do it, okay? So, I would like to start uh, with uh, the judicial practice. My, my, my aim here is uh, trying to establish uh, Brazilian state practice through judicial practice, but also through treaty practice. And I will speak, uh, I, I will explain um, uh, further on why I will focus after speaking about judicial practice, about treaty practice, because uh, uh, Brazilian Supreme Court uh, established that uh, practice regarding the immunities must be focused on treaty practice. So I would like to start with judicial practice and I would like to start with uh, with, um, um, with a decision of the Brazilian Supreme Court, the extraordinary appeal 1034840. This is true, Jan. I mean, there is, <laughs> this is, uh, the number of the extraordinary appeal is more than one million, okay? Uh, so, one million, uh, no, okay, I, I, I won't try this. Okay, one zero three four eight four zero is more elegant. Uh, it's um, a decision of uh, 2017, okay, 2017. As a matter of fact, this decision just um, uh, summarizes previous decisions of the Federal Supreme Court uh, on immunities of international organizations. And what does this decision say that is, in, I think, in total um, agreement with previous uh, case law of the Supreme Court? It says that, and this is the thesis fixed in such a, an extraordinary appeal, the Supreme Court now it has the practice to fix a thesis that is for many purposes a binding thesis, including for uh, lower courts, but also for administration as well. So it's, it is important to state this because uh, this thesis fixed it's bi is binding not only for judges in Brazil, but also for the administration. So the thesis fixed by the Federal Supreme Court in this extraordinary appeal was that, and uh, here I will try to, to translate a very complicated language, even in Portuguese, it's, uh, uh, but I will try to do this. So the thesis is, the international organization that has guaranteed 
immunities from jurisdiction and execution in a treaty to which Brazil is a party, and a treaty to which Brazil has internalized in its own national law, cannot be sued except in cases of express renunciation of such immunity by the international organization. So the idea here is that, I mean, the whole law of immunities of international organizations must be searched on treaty law. Uh, no customary international legal rule is applicable in terms of immunities to international organizations. And the justice that uh, wrote the, majorita uh, the majoritarian opinion, Justice Luis Fuchs, established this in a very clear fashion in his opinion. Uh, and uh, he said that immunity from jurisdiction and execution are not necessarily an inherent attribute of international organizations. Of course, there is some ambiguity here because he says that are not necessarily, but in any case, the, the reasoning of, the, of his opinion is all based on the idea that we can only find immunities of international organizations in treaties. Okay? There is a very interesting dissenting opinion as a matter of fact, it was the only dissenting opinion uh, that, uh, that reached the merits, the substance of the problem, which wa uh, was the, the opinion of Justice Fakin. Justice Fakin suggested in his opinion, in his dissenting opinion, that past case law of the Federal Supreme Court supported the idea that the mere recognition of the international legal personality of an international organization implied, implied their immunities from jurisdiction and execution, possibly uh, by means of international customary law. Uh, the position of Justice Fakin is not ver a very clear one because he, he just mentions one um, one case judged by the Supreme Court that uh, because he found that an international organization was a, an international legal person, so immunity is derived from the personality and not exactly from the treaty. But in any case, I think it's, it's, it's quite interesting to, to provide this uh, different opinion because if it uh, constituted the majority of the court, the, the scenario would be completely different. So the majoritarian opinion was that we can only find immunities in treaties. So uh, we can conclude that uh, thus treaty law is possibly the only source for immunities of international organizations in Brazil. So if treaty law is the only source uh, it's absolutely essential to go to the treaties, uh, please uh, go ahead, okay, to go to, uh, to treaties, treaties concluded by Brazil with international organizations. Uh, unfortunately, I could not go, uh, I mean, to the history of all treaties concluded by Brazil with international organizations through history. But I focused uh, my research on uh, treaties concluded in, uh, since 2000, the year 2000. And uh, we, can found that we can find that Brazil concluded 22 treaties dealing with immunities of international organizations. There are other treaties, but there are 22 that uh, deal with uh, international organizations. Among those 22, treaties, eight were multilateral treaties dealing in general terms with immunities of international organizations in member states, like for example, um, the general uh, agreement of the uh, International Criminal Court to establish immunities uh, uh, for uh, the officials of the court. Also the International Seabed Authority Agreement on Immunities. These are general agreements. It's a, it's, a, it's a way to establish immunities, although 
it's very difficult to find an international organization trying to fix uh, uh, an office in Brazil without concluding a host agreement. Normally, those uh, international organizations, they have those agreements that they are umbrella agreements to establish immunities for their officials. But in any case, if they want to uh, fix uh, offices uh, in, in certain countries, normally they do more than this. They, um, they conclude uh, host agreements. And I try to, 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 to focus on bilateral agreements among this set of 22 treaties because bilateral agreements, they show more clearly uh, the possibilities for a state to negotiate with an international organization the extent of immunities. So uh, among those 22 treaties, eight were multilateral and 14 were bilateral treaties. And more than that, among those 14 bilateral treaties, just 10 were host agreements and four were agreements related to cooperation arrangements between Brazil and the international organization concerned. So from this universe of 22 treaties, I will focus here just on 10 because I'm excluding multilateral treaties and also bilateral treaties that are not focused on immunities. I'm more concerned here on host agreements. Why? Because of, of the reason I just provided, that they give us a better picture of the possibilities for extending or not immunities. Because in, in, in terms of a multilateral treaty, uh, uh, the state has no freedom, uh, I mean, to establish specific conditions for immunities. And in any case, as I said, it's very difficult for uh, an organization. It, normally, an international organization does not think it's uh, sufficient if it will establish an office in a certain country just to have that general agreement. Normally, they, they go and they conclude a host agreement. It's interesting, not for the purposes of what, what I will present here, but it's interesting to note that uh, within this universe of 10 agreements, just one was related to an international organization with headquarters in Brazil. Uh, there are just a few uh, international organizations that uh, have headquarters in Brazil. And one of them, and maybe the most important one, uh, is the Amazon Cooperation Treaty Organization that is seated in Brasilia. Okay. So uh, here I will, I mean, to, to give you uh, a general idea about the treaty practice of Brazil on uh, on immunities, I will focus on host agreements, uh, but not on bilateral agreements dealing with other aspects and just incidentally on, uh, on immunities, and I will not focus also on multilateral treaties. Well, um, as I said, the focus on bilateral treaties shows better how Brazil negotiated the extension of immunities. And the focus on host agreements gives a clear picture of the scenario since they deal more thoroughly with immunities. So let's now try to summarize some ideas that uh, are common or not in those host agreements. First, first inviolability of the premises of international organizations uh, or the offices. Uh, it depends, I mean, the terminology depends on each uh, agreement. Uh, as you know, I mean, premises of diplomatic missions are inviolable, uh, and the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations allows no exceptions to this. On what relates international organizations in Brazil, it's interesting because uh, this idea was transposed to host agreement, but there is almost a split. In what sense? Uh, at least in four agreements, there are some exceptions for the inviolability of the premises or the offices of international organizations. In some cases, 
consent to enter in the premises is presumed in cases of great danger. This is the case of the Latin Union um, host agreement. Fire or an accident putting, putting public safety in danger. This is the case of the organization of Ibero-American States for Education, Science, and Culture. And also, it's quite similar, the Arab League of States host agreement. And also, the New Development Bank has uh, uh, an office in Brazil. It, uh, there is an, uh, an exception to entering into premises that relates to national disaster, fire, or any emergence that put human life in danger. And there is also a very curious uh, clause that states that agents of public services can inspect, repair, conserve, rebuild, and relocate, for example, tubes, pipes, etc. Uh, in this case, the, the organization has the duty to allow for public, uh, agents of public service to enter into the premises of the organization. Uh, so this is interesting because it shows that uh, uh, there isn't a uniformity in not, uh, there isn't um, a complete transpose of the idea of what happens with diplomatic uh, premises in uh, those host agreements. Another aspect also related to inviolability of the premises is the duty of abstention and explicitly the duty of protection of those premises. Uh, in generally, ge generally speaking, uh, those host agreements, they establish the duty of abstention, but also the duty of the, uh, of the state that hosts the, the international organization to protect uh, the premises or the offices of the international organizations. Some uh, mention uh, a due diligence duty, like, for example, the New Development Bank uh, uh, host agreement. But there are some exceptions, like, for example, the Latin Union and the Union of South American Nations, uh, they, they do not establish specifically the duty of protection. Despite that, I think it's uh, maybe we can imply the duty of protection especially because of the idea of functionality uh, that uh, bases international organizations. So if international organizations are in Brazil and they have to, 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 to fulfill uh, its functions, it's uh, essential for the state that, there, that is receiving, that is hosting the organization to provide for a different level of protection of the premises or the offices of the organizations. Um, another aspect also related to the inviolability of the premises is a clause of no use of premises to grant asylum or shelter. In uh, at least six agreements of those uh, 10 agreements I just uh, mentioned to you, uh, there are a specific uh, reference to the fact that the offices or the premises of the international organizations uh, cannot be used to grant asylum or shelter. I don't know, Jan, if this is a general clause, um, I mean, common in many host agreements. I don't know. Uh, uh, I wouldn't dare to, to generalize such an idea. But in, in the case of Brazil, this is quite natural, especially because in Latin America, the idea of diplomatic asylum is a binding one, uh, if not by treaties, uh, but also by uh, a regional customary international legal rule. So there is this kind of, of clause that uh, possibly, I wouldn't say for sure, but possibly because of the practice of states like Brazil to grant asylum uh, in premises of diplomatic missions. But there is a split. At least four agreements, they do not mention this. Although it is extremely doubtful if functionality allows for such a power of the international organization. It, it would be very curious to, I mean, to see an international organization granting 
asylum for someone in the premises or the offices of uh, the international organization. Well, uh, going beyond the inviolability of premises, it's quite interesting, quite interesting because there is a general acceptance, acceptance of full inviolability of archives, documents, and correspondence. In each of those host agreements, there is a full grant of inviolability of archives, documents, and correspondence. So there is no uh, exception to this. This is something that is quite uh, important for the functioning of international organizations and also for Brazil. Uh, so it appears in every single host agreement. Another point, immunity of property, okay? Uh, immunities regarding properties of the international organizations. Most treaties, most host agreements, they are explicit uh, in terms of establishing that property, not only premises, the offices uh, of, the, of the international organizations, but also the property, like for example, vehicles or other property that is uh, situated uh, outside the offices or the premises. So generally, there is this, uh, there is um, um, the idea that property is immune in, in Brazilian uh, domestic jurisdiction, although this is implied in some host agreements, uh, like the International Teen Association, uh, which is the successor of the Teen Council, which is uh, maybe there are postgraduate students here. Maybe we could, uh, I mean, uh, uh, choose as a subject for for further studies because, especially in English law, there is a big. <laughs> there were many cases. Uh, I mean, um, those and cases about the Teen Council, about uh, issues regarding invulnerability, immunities. Uh, it's a, it's a, it was a very it's a very interesting field of study. Uh, what happened in judicial in in uh, British domestic courts about the International Teen Council? So uh, there are other uh, host agreements in which uh, the immunity of property is implicit and not explicit. Freedom of communication. It's interesting because normally there is a general reference to uh, uh, to the idea that the international organization has uh, no less freedom than that applied to all other international organizations. So it's like establishing an, uh, an equivalence in terms of protection of the freedom of communication. But there is a problem with a clause like that because if uh, immunities and also freedoms or freedoms of the international organizations are only established by treaties it's very complicated to speak about the standard of what is freedom that is applied to international organizations because to international organizations because it varies depending on the treaty. But there, there is a clause uh, that is quite uh, common in many host agreements. Some host agreements go even uh, beyond that, and they mention a freedom equivalent to that applied to diplomatic missions. In that case, it's, uh, it's clear because there is the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations and also very clear um, customary rules on freedom of communication of diplomatic uh, uh, missions. Bags, there is a general reference of bags of other international organizations that uh, uh, Brazilian, Brazilian state must assure that the um, international organization will grant the possibility of receiving and sending bags just like other international organizations. And in that case, there are also references. The, the, the standard for reference is not only international organizations, but diplomatic missions. In case of tax immunities, uh, the general reference that there is is that international organizations enjoy in Brazil full tax immunities except for indirect taxes and taxes for specific public services. What, what is not uh, something new because uh, also 
in the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, immunities does not apply to those situations, to indirect taxes, like for example, taxes that are included into the price of a, a certain good, and also specific public services. But it's interesting because there are some wider exceptions in some cases, in some host agreements, like for example, the organization of Ibero-American states for education, science, and culture, and also the League of Arab States, they say that there are no tax immunity for capital gains or tax related to succession that happens in Brazil, okay? heritage. Uh, organizations' immunities. Um, it's interesting to know that there is a trend of growing exceptions. I wouldn't say this trend is related to time in terms of, uh, I mean, more recent uh, treaties are uh, establishing growing exceptions. But in any case, there is a, there, in many host agreements, there is a mood of the Brazilian state to establish exceptions to immunities. And there are different kinds of exceptions, uh, like for example, I'll we'll just provide some, ex uh, I, I can just provide you with this, with those slides. Uh, I would like just uh, right now to give a, a, a general picture of the situation. The Latin Union host agreement, for example, establishes the exception of civil actions for car accidents, okay? Which is something that in, in terms of diplomatic immunity, the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, it establishes no exceptions. But in, in this host agreement, there are uh, exceptions for civil actions for car accidents. Or judicial attachment for wages and earnings owed to the international organization's officers and also civil actions for contractual transactions. Jan uh, uh, spoke about this, something about this, about international organizations when they uh, establish uh, contractual transactions or relations or they are, relate, they, uh, they are focused on commercial activities. There is a general trend in terms of when the organization is linked to those activities to establish ex exceptions. Like, for example, the New Development Bank, uh, the host agreement uh, regarding the New Development Bank's Bank uh, establishes as an exception uh, civil actions for contractual transactions uh, and even execution, execution of an arbitral award. You can execute an international organization, this international organization, although this is not a very common uh, kind of clause in host agreements. But, uh, I mean, the idea here is because it's a, it's a bank, so uh, it deals with commercial transactions, so it is important for the state to have some tools to execute uh, some judgments. And lastly, uh, officers' immunities. What is the most interesting thing about officers' immunities in host agreements it's, is the exception to Brazilian nationals or permanent residents. Uh, in those cases, only official immunities are applied, not personal ones. Like, for example, uh, immunity uh, in uh, criminal matters or in civil matters. Normally, when uh, officials of an international organization are Brazilians or permanent residents, they only have official immunities such as uh, immunities regarding words written and spoken. This is a classical, a classic um, uh, immunity, official immunity. This is the general idea, but there are some exceptions. And normally, those exceptions are established by the power and a specific international organization has to negotiate with the government. Like, for example, 
the, in the case of, of the organization of Ibero-American States for Education, Science, and Culture, uh, there are immunities uh, to wages of Brazilian nationals or permanent residents who are international organizations officers. So uh, there are no immunity, even if, if someone is a Brazilian national or a permanent resident in Brazil, uh, his or her wage is immune from uh, Brazilian taxation. Okay? But the same doesn't happen, for example, in the League of Arab States, uh, uh, because in this case, tax immunity does not apply to Brazilian nationals or permanent residents. What I could say is that, I mean, generally speaking, there is this, uh, the, this movement, uh, and you, we can see this narrative in different host agreements, the movement for, uh, of Brazil establishing always exceptions uh, to Brazilian nationals or permanent residents, although this is not a rule. Sometimes it happens uh, that, I mean, some organizations, they get uh, immunity um, for their offices uh, regarding, for example, wages. But something we cannot see uh, in any host agreement is uh, immunity from criminal matters. No Brazilian or permanent resident has this, this kind of immunity. Normally, when there are exceptions to, to the exception that Brazilian nationals and permanent resident has no immunity, they have no immunities in Brazil, normally it is related to taxation, but not to other matters. Okay, and finally, uh, just uh, some remaining questions on this uh, very general picture of immunities of international organizations in host agreements in Brazil. Uh, there is a quite curious clause in the Arab League of States uh, host agreement that establishes that uh, no clause shall be interpreted against the taking by the host state of measures to grant domestic security. Uh, I, I was not focused on, on multilateral treaties, but this is something that is starting to appear several times in some multilateral agreements. What's this? is for example for the state to take security measures regarding the premises of an international organization uh, like for example if the offices or the premises of international organizations are being used to store weapons or uh, people within the office office is involved with uh, drug trafficking and, and, and things like that so there are some, some specific uh, host agreements in Brazil establishing this, but this is something I can see, although I cannot give you a very precise picture because I didn't focus on this, but I can see this kind of thing happening in, also in mo some multilateral agreements. This very general uh, principle to interpret uh, the agreement in terms of not prohibiting the whole state to take measure to grant the security, internal or domestic security. Another point, and this is quite uh, interesting, uh, especially regarding a topic that Jan also mentioned, which is a dispute, settlement of disputes regarding uh, international organizations, is that only one, only one of the host agreements establishes uh, uh, <coughs> binding mean to settle disputes regarding the treaty, regarding the host agreement. Only the host agreement uh, regarding the United Nations uh, High Commissioner for Refugees. This is the only treaty that establishes arbitration. In the other cases, there are no binding means to, to settle disputes uh, between the state and the international organizations, uh, the, uh, the international organization. This is quite uh, important because, uh, and this is something the IOC is dealing with, 
what to do in those cases, like for example, labor disputes of, uh, uh, of uh, workers of the international organizations. Uh, if they don't have access, for example, to uh, administrative uh, tribunals uh, within the organizations, uh, how, what do they do to solve uh, 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 labor dispute, for example. And this is quite a remarkable trend in Brazilian practice, the trend that uh, only other peaceful means, non-binding peaceful means, are allowed in those host agreements. The picture is different uh, in multilateral treaties, although I, uh, uh, I, I don't dare to establish very precise conclusions on this. But in general uh, agreements establishing immunities for officials, normally a binding mechanism, a binding mean is established, like for example, arbitration or recourse to a specific tribunal. Uh, another point is uh, the organization of Ibero-American States for Education, Science and Culture uh, host agreement establishes, this is something I mean, at least from my own perspective, quite new. I, I never saw something like this in a host agreement. A mechanism similar to that of persona non grata to uh, an official of, uh, of an international organization. So uh, if, uh, I mean, passing some, some uh, procedures, uh, Brazil has the right to invite an official of an international organization to uh, I mean, to, to go away, I mean, to, from, from the country. This is quite interesting, although this is not a pattern, because uh, I could only find this kind of, this kind of uh, resource available or remedy uh, available to the state in this agreement. But uh, uh, I wouldn't say that this is a general idea present in many in many uh, host agreements. I don't see this in general in multilateral agreements establishing immunities uh, for officials of international organizations. So uh, maybe it's a very specific one, but I wouldn't dare to, to say, uh, I mean, generally, uh, something generally on this. And finally, uh, and this is um, a conclusion, it is very difficult to establish an evolving pattern in time, as I said. In some specific areas, we can see uh, uh, another kind of pattern, like, for example, what Brazil needs in terms of what an international organization will do within the territory, like, for example, immunities of international organizations, officials. Uh, there is the idea trend of um, that, uh, I mean, immunities are not allowed to, not granted to Brazilian nationals or permanent residents. But I cannot see this pattern evolving through time. Like, for example, there is a growing um, uh, uh, pattern of making immunities more relative. Uh, it's very difficult to find this. And I think this is very difficult specifically because the law of immunities of international organizations in Brazil has the only source, uh, treaty law is the only source of international organizations' immunity. So this, um, if this is so, so all is solved by negotiation between the international organization and the Brazilian state. So it, uh, the extent of the immunities depends mainly on one side, on the capacity of the Brazilian state to negotiate, and on the other side, on the capacity of the international organization to negotiate, I mean, to get more immunities, for example, uh, or not. So uh, this is something uh, that uh, emerges from this um, analysis of the treaty practice uh, that mirrors the main idea that was established by a very 
uh, long case law of the Brazilian Supreme Court that the only source of immunities of international organizations is treaty law. So we have to look only uh, into treaty law to find what's the extent of immunities uh, granted to international organizations, including their offices. So this is, uh, this is the, um, the general idea of, of my research, Professor Lucas, and I would like to congratulate you once again for the initiative and uh, to say that it's really an honor, a pleasure to be here with, with you and uh, all good friends I have here and uh, Professor Ian Clubbers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Galindo. I think that we are very lucky to have your overview and analysis of this very unknown practice, but very important for us to understand this face of the law of international organizations. Luckily enough, we have time for discussions. We had a lot of food for thought, and then we have properly food, uh, one o'clock. But uh, we have 20 minutes for questions from the public, uh, either to Professor Claver or Professor Galindo. So feel free to raise your hands. OK, you have already here uh, fire pellet. And OK, uh, Rafael, Rodrigo, and Sara, and then um, uh, Augusto. You can start, perhaps you need a microphone, or you can speak louder, yeah? Could please introduce yourself and then ask the question. Maybe it would be good to get the mic. Yeah. Yeah, so that we can hear it as well. So, thank you, professors, for the lecture. Uh, my name is Rafael. I am a student at the graduate program here at the university. And my question is, is related with this association uh, of international organizations with the promotion of the uh, common good. Because I think that this is. Uh, somewhat linked with the fact that uh, international organizations law is construed around the idea of functionalism that has uh, that uh, kind of favors the, the, the organization in this uh, relation with uh, other entities and uh, also has its limits in explaining the, the institutional law but some fields of institutional law are construed around this idea such as the immunities of international organizations. So my question would be some, uh, something like how can we think, rethink uh, the law of immunities of international organizations without functionalism at its core? Well, um, my name is Sarah. I'm a master's student here uh, under the supervision of Professor Lucas. And um, my question is also going to be directed to Professor Jan Klabers. Um, well, I mean, hearing you, you talk here and reading your works, I'm already, I'm, I, I have the impression that this theory is very insightful for understanding uh, how international organizations work in a more uh, realist sense. Um, but my question would be uh, how this, this theory could be translated into a more uh, normative framework? Uh, like how, how could it have uh, normative effects in changing some of the regimes of international organizations that we have nowadays? Also, especially immunity, but uh, also thinking on responsibility that also has this link to functionality. So thank you very much. I'm Rodrigo. I'm a master's student here as well at UFMG under the supervision of Professor Lucas. Uh, my question is to Professor Gadindo. I thought the whole panorama of practice was really interesting and I was curious about the fact that probably this, our Supreme Court had the chance at any point of interpreting any of these agreements even in an ancillary way. And uh, if you think that this perhaps ancillary interpretation could be seen as a way to restrict or expand immunities uh, of uh, international organizations in, in Brazil. Something similar to what happened in the US law by the, the Supreme Court of the United States, although there it was uh, domestic law, the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, and here is the interpretation of treaties. So I'd like to know more your opinion on that. Thank you. Before the second round, Professor Aziz has a question and then you start the second round. Professor Aziz also has a question. 
Sure, I will try to um, hold myself a little bit because I'll have other opportunities of interacting with uh, Galindo and Professor Jan Klaber. So, but uh, anyway, I take this chance to ask uh, Galindo a question. Is that um, the, the point that I wanted to make is you analyze 10 agreements, and of course they all refer to an, to an agreement of, the, of, the, of uh, the Brazilian state with an international organization. I would think that there would be um, lots of variation from one, one, agreement, one agreement to another as we have different institutions, but not a lot of variations from the agreements that they have made with the Brazilian state and other agreements they have made elsewhere, no, uh, notwithstanding the fact that those are bilateral agreements. I would, th I would think that they, they are quite rigid uh, and that you won't find many variations. I don't know if you have uh, analyzed that, if you have checked other agreements that these 10 institutions have made. Uh, so I, I would like to hear uh, your, um, your views on that you know, have your, and hear your comments on that. Thank you. Professor Galindo, would like to start? No. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Someone needs more time, right? Um, thank you for uh, paying attention and for asking the difficult questions. If I knew the answer to both of your questions, I'd be rich and famous, right? <laughs> I am neither rich and I'm certainly not famous in the Madonna category, so there we are. Now, the, the easy answer is I'm working on this. The slightly less easy answer is that I might never finish this. Uh, I do, however, have the intuition, both, both of your questions were fairly uh, similar, really. Uh, what to do with international immunities law and what to do with, yeah, where would the rethinking of international organizations law, what kind of law would that result in? Um, I don't know yet. We've heard from Professor Galindo that much of immunities law is uh, negotiate, negotiated. It's not out there in nature, it's not even custom, which I think is act actually a fairly uh, accurate assessment that there cannot be much custom in this, precisely because no one wants there to be custom. Everyone wants to keep some control over the uh, scope of privileges and immunities of their international organizations. So everything is subject to negotiation. I've, I've participated in some of those myself, and that was such a wonderful education to realize that you're not only having to talk with the foreign office, but also with the defense ministry, a labor ministry, an internal affairs department, justice department, the tax department in particular. Um, so there was a whole array of partners around the table, none of them interested in the good of mankind, really. Uh, the tax people just wanted more tax money to come out of international organizations. The Justice Department, or the Ministry of Labor, another one, insisted on uh, uh, work permits for the spouses of officials, that sort of thing. Very detailed, but very uh, you cannot ignore it. My intuition, however, is that the law is bound to go around in circles unless the um, inutility, perhaps, the uselessness of those current circles is made visible. And that's what I've been trying to do so far, I guess. One of the problems that comes with this is that each and every one of us is socialized into functionalism. I, I don't know what you guys have been reading here. Maybe a little bit of me, but probably also the, the big schermers and blocker book, International Institutional Law, which is the Bible, which every international organization's lawyer has on his or her desk, like wherever you go, whether it's uh, the UN or whether it's the Office, Alofa, uh, what is it? Office Franco Allemand pour la Jeunesse. <laughs> it's a, a two-state organization in existence since the 1960s. All legal advisors will have that on their desk, and that is the functionalist Bible, and that like the seeds were sown by Paul Reinsch in 1911, 1906 at the Milwaukee Bankers Club. And that has never been seriously contested or uh, looked at. So you have a very weird situation that the law is based on a pattern of thinking that was put in place 100 years ago, has not kept up with the times, and has been reproduced time and again by giving students the same text to read. 
Uh, and that's how these things work. Like you can find fault with it, and I think I do, but that's just how it goes. So I've made it my mission, if you will, that sounds a bit pompous, um, but I've made it my mission to at least make visible that much of that is ideology, has very little explanatory power, and that if we ever get to a working body of international organizations law that does not only benefit the organizations, but maybe also you know, the victims of cholera, or the victims of sexual harassment in the workplace, or what have you, that one needs to open that up and, and say, hey, wait a second, the law is tilted very much in favor of the international organizations. That's nice for them but maybe not so nice for the rest of us. Now, I'm perfectly willing to concede that a certain amount of Im immunities and privileges will be necessary, that there should be a certain space carved out to let organizations do what they think they should be doing. But maybe that space is a bit large at the moment. So, you know, step two will be <laughs> to try and think of how to minimize that space a little. But I don't know yet where that will take me. Uh, sorry. Thank you, Professor Clavis. Professor Galin? Thank you. Uh, I mean, on the first question on functionality and immunities, I just can, I can just um, give some um, very raw observations, I mean, especially with the Jan here. But, I mean, uh, well, I'm not very, uh, let's, um, I have to be very careful what the words I will choose, but uh, it's, I mean, the idea, I mean, let me just uh, bring you the examples I just um, brought. There are different sets of immunities established for different kinds of, of uh, organizations. And I think it shows that, I mean, if functionality is really something essential for the working of international organizations, that would be a standard. Uh, so we should uh, apply the same set of immunities for all international organiza uh, organizations. But what happens? What happens is that it depends, of course, I mean, talking about host agreements, I'm not talking about general agreements regarding immunities, it depends of, on the power a uh, specific international organization has to negotiate with the, with the government. And I think it happens with, uh, with every single international organization in every single country. Like, for example, Ian knows um, uh, far better than me, there is a, uh, a historic example in the U.S. that uh, uh, the U.S. didn't accept uh, tax immunities for American nationals or uh, permanent residents. So the UN had to establish like a surplus for the wages of uh, American citizens. Otherwise, American citizens will uh, earn less than foreigners. So it depends on this, on the, on the power a certain organization, international organization, has to negotiate with the government. Um, and, and Speaking, I mean, trying to respond to the second question, if the Supreme Court can interpret uh, and consequently restrict immunities, uh, if we read carefully the, the, the decision of the Brazilian Supreme Court, it's a very short one, and it's not a very reasoned uh, uh, decision. Uh, the, the majority opinion of uh, Justice Luis Fuchs is just, okay, there, is, there are treaties that establish immunities, so we have to respect treaties, otherwise we can incur in state responsibility, that's all. So I, I don't see much space, I mean, in, in, in current jurisprudence of the, of the Federal Supreme Court to evolve on this. Be and I think in many ways, it's easier for the Supreme Court to say a thing like this. So if it's on the treaty, so we will apply it. And we won't uh, 
I mean, investigate on the nature of the international organization if it really needs, I mean, to fulfill its functions. So it, what is only important is a treaty. But of course, I, I had the honor to translate uh, uh, an article of Jan uh, called The Meaning of Rules. Rules are not, uh, I mean, uh, they are constructs of, 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 of language. So, I mean, what uh, a treaty uh, says is, is not the final word on a certain legal issue. It's just uh, the beginning. And so that is why this position of the Supreme Court is quite complicated one. I'm not saying I disagree or if I agree uh, with, the, with the decision. But in any case, it's a very poor decision in terms of reasoning. Um, uh, and, uh, and finally, the last question, the very good question of, of Professor Aziz on variations. Um, I think, uh, I mean, the universe of uh, host agreements uh, I, I investigated is, uh, is uh, is different in terms of the kinds of organizations. For, for example, there is the uh, United, United Nations High Commissioner on Refugees, but there, is, there are also regional organizations like the Ibero-American States Organization. So there is no template, I, 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 can, I can, can say you for sure. There is no template, but uh, there are some recurrent ideas that are uh, in, in treaties of organizations of a specific size, for example. If they are regional, they are trained in terms of repetition of some terms. But, for example, if you go into the, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, it's completely different. It's a completely different uh, agreement. So, uh, and I think it has to do with the capacity of the organization to to propose something to the to the to the government so a regional organization will uh, be focused on uh, host agreements of regional organizations as well and not to universal uh, organizations this is something that maybe but I, I wouldn't dare as I, as I, as I said to establish very specific uh, conclusions on this, but maybe this is something that uh, is um, we, we we can see uh, more similarities. So, I mean, in conclusion, I think it depends more on the power of the international organization to uh, I mean to negotiate with the government than with functionality than with uh, as, as Jan said, I mean, uh, although some are uh, really concerned with common good, but uh, sometimes they are not seen uh, as, uh, I mean, as trying to, to advance those common goods. It depends more on the capacity to negotiate and to extend or, uh, certain immunities if immunities are related to functionality, what is something that in practice it's not very I mean, easy to see. Thank you, very much. Thank you Professor Galindo. Professor Klabers wants to react. Augusto has a question. Do you have a last question perhaps? Pedro, okay. And then Augusto, please. Oh, my name is Augusto. I have recently graduated from the Federal University of Uberlândia. And my question goes to Professor Galindo. Uh, Professor Jan mentioned uh, structural issues that international organizations are facing nowadays. And Professor Jan has also mentioned that internal aspects of these organizations normally do not receive the attention that they should. Professor Galindo, as a member of the International Law Commission, and as a Brazilian, do you see structural difficulties inside the organization that especially affect third world members, 
not only third world member states, but third world member states representatives, such as yourself. For example, the non-existence of sub-regional work groups inside the uh, ILC, or the difference in funds that members of certain countries may receive in comparison to members of more uh, powerful countries. And do these structural difficulties uh, um, influence the outcome of the conclusions and the drafts that are produced inside the ILC in the sense that uh, some third world countries and members may not be able to engage in the production of the consensus as much as others. Thank you. Hi, my name is Pedro, I'm a bachelor student currently under Professor Lucas' supervision for a research project. And I wanted to ask Professor Jan a question. So from what I got from your talk, your research is closely linked to the um, law and context method. And I wanted to ask, to try to overcome the practical and structural issues, which methodological approach could we then take to, should we take the comparison to an ideal model or compare it to different organizations that are not necessarily international organizations? What would you suggest? Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. In our bingo of conferences, we had the methodological question and the Tweo question. So we are fulfilled. <laughs> Professor Aziz also wants to question something. Oh, it always <laughs> comes first. <laughs> well, this is more a curiosity. Uh, as, I, as you spoke, I remembered the first edition of the book. Mm -hmm. And in the preface, um, you mentioned that uh, there is room for the argument that the European Union is a part of international law. So my two questions, actually, or two curiosities, I should say. This was, I think, much more for dinner time than for uh, pre-lunch time. Uh -huh. But first of all, do you see the European Union as an international organization as part of international law? And second, do you, do you think that the European Union works for the common good of humanity, or at least for the betterment of the lives of Europeans? Well, just <laughs> the floor is yours. Okay. <laughs> we're, we're being registered, eh? Just we're, we're being <laughs> recorded, okay. In that case, I'll speak freely. <laughs> uh, no, first, a footnote to uh, something Professor Galindo said uh, about the, the, the international organization, the, the host agreement recognizing a possibility of granting a right to asylum. Um, which I think is fairly unique, yes. I have not seen it. And then you said it would be very difficult to find a functionalist justification for that. Which I think is generally speaking accurate, but what if it's UNHCR? Wouldn't that be able to tap into its function and say, hey, we gotta give this guy asylum because otherwise all hell will break loose. And there might be other humanitarian organizations to whom that applies. That only speaks, of course, to what you accurately also noticed, the, the, the wide diversity of international organizations. And that makes this branch so difficult. Like the UN is an international organization, NATO is an international organization, they do completely different things. The European University Institute, completely different things. The New Development Bank, yet again, different things. And, you know, the CERN, oh, that reminds me, everyone with an iPhone, you, you remember, you, you recognize the touch screen, right? That was developed not by NASA or something, but by the Centre Européen pour la Recherche Nucléaire, CERN, an international organization doing nuclear research in Geneva in the early 1970s when they realized they needed a way to quickly connect all kinds of supercomputers without having all kinds of cables. They developed the touch screen and it's now part of our daily life. Isn't that wonderful? Um, but uh, the EU, I was getting to the EU at some point, <laughs> trying to avoid that, of course. Is the EU an international organization? Well, yeah, sure. Um, is it an international organization, however, of a very specific kind? And we've always realized that. We've always said it's sui generis, like one of its kind, uh, or category, 
not possible to put in a box. And I think that's also correct, even if it doesn't tell us much to say it's our category, because that only means it's our category, right? It does not tell us what it is, it only tells us that it's not part of something else, or not similar to other things. Um, but for certain purposes, I'm perfectly willing to accept it as an international organization, including for teaching purposes. Um, for certain purposes, for certain other purposes, I think it comes a lot closer to statehood. That um, the way it works is uh, almost indistinguishable from a federal state, maybe a confederal state, or the sort of federalism that has yet to be given a name. Um, so it depends a little. But generally speaking, I have no particular problem with saying the EU is an international organization. I do not think that generally it works for the common good, no. <laughs> um, why do I say that? Because I have actually read its constitution, which says the EU shall protect the interest of its citizens and its member states, which is something other than saying it shall protect the interest of people starving to death in Sierra Leone. And there is a chance that people are starving to death in Sierra Leone because the EU has done something, whether it comes to textiles or fisheries or whatever. Um, so, common good? No. Well, in some cases, maybe. The, the EU has been very progressive, I think, in pushing through measures to protect the global environment in ways that others have not necessarily been very inspired by, but the EU is usually on the right side of that argument, I think. It is not always on the right side in other arguments. Um, it has been, and maybe that's a good thing actually, it has been trying to torpedo the coming of an international convention on interstate investment settlement uh, by launching all sorts of proposals that it will realize no one can ever accept, but then have to be taken seriously, have to be discussed, process postponed for another five years. And a plus a change. So, but long story short, no, the EU, like most regional organizations, the OAS as well, uh, the African Union as well, the Organization of Islamic Countries as well, tend to focus on the interest of it, their member states and the citizens of their member states. The most clear example, of course, is OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. It's not working for the global common good. It's working for the global good of Saudi Arabia and it's uh, some of its citizens, mostly the male ones, I guess. Um, that's, that's a couple of steps removed from the common good. <coughs> well, uh, I mean, being, I mean, focused on the topic we are discussing uh, here, uh, I mean, what I can tell is, uh, I mean, give you, provide some, some ideas about uh, how uh, members of the IOC discussed um, the topic of, um, of settlement of disputes uh, uh, regarding international organizations. Um, well, uh, I think the, the, the most important uh, issue that we discussed on this topic was a new definition of international uh, organizations. Uh, and uh, I don't know if probably Jan does not agree with the definition. I think I, I don't agree as well. But um, I remember I was quite scared when uh, Miguel Serpa Suarez, which is the legal advisor of the United Nations, when he was addressing the IOC uh, some weeks later, we. We, we found a new definition of international organization. He just provided some uh, uh, new developments, and one of the developments he mentioned was, well, the IOC found a new definition of international organization, so I was very scared. If the legal advisor of the UN is saying that the IOC found a new definition, so this is a big problem. <laughs> but um, but uh, uh, on, this, on this issue, <coughs> I mean, the main problem was not one related to uh, <coughs> third world members of the IOC or European members. I think it was of uh, a definition that was more conservative 
in a definition that was not so conservative because the special rapporteur was offering a new definition that was not a conservative one. Uh, and many members were of the opinion that we should retain the definition of the articles on state responsibility of international organizations, which is a definition, I have to admit, a very tautological one. But in any case, it's, uh, you are on a safe haven. And the, and the special rapporteur, Professor Reinisch, he proposed something that is different based on elements. Uh, and I remember there was a quite, uh, a quite uh, strong division among members because some w would like to retain the definition in uh, the, the definition provided in the articles on state pre on responsibility of international organizations, and those that were not opposed to the vision of the of August Reinisch, the the special rapporteur. So. At the end of the day, it was, a, I think it was a quite, a quite Solomonic uh, decision because we included the idea of elements, but also we included the idea of international legal personality. So in many senses, it's a definition that, uh, I mean, tries to, I mean, to put together different visions, a conservative one and a not so conservative one. And I, I don't think on this issue there was a division on on uh, on member member uh, members of the IOC. I assume that in other issues, maybe some that uh, will be discussed in this session, there will be divisions regarding the position of the members in the geopolitical scenario of international law, like for example, immunity of state officials. But this is not the focus of our seminar, so I, will, I won't <laughs> go into this. Okay, thank you. You have a question to Pedro? Yeah, I just realized I had not answered Pedro. I started to feel very bad about that. <laughs> so indulge me, please, for another two minutes or so. Because I think it's an excellent question. Um, not just that I felt bad about it, but it's also an excellent <laughs> question. Like, how do you approach topics? My general take is that one should use whatever method helps to answer your research question. So be open-minded and don't call yourself a law and economics person and you want to <laughs> approach everything from that perspective. Or you call yourself a crit, like a critical scholar, you want to approach everything from that perspective. Because sometimes that's useless. It gives you <laughs> no answer whatsoever to what you actually want to know. Of course, unless what you want to know is to be known as a law and economics person or a crit, then that's fine. But that doesn't give you the academic answer that you might be looking for. Uh, I think you're right in suggesting that what I try to do owes a bit to law in context. Never sure what that means, but have a, a rough idea and that entails that one does not only look at la doctrine, at what the, the black letter says, for a good reason there is no black letter here, or very little, and because I want to go digger, uh, digger, that's a jet lag, dig deeper <laughs> underneath the black letter. Why does the black letter say what it says? What's going on there? Could it have said something else? If so, why did it not say something else? Um, one should be aware of different methodologies. One should not become hostage to different uh, methodologies. What I try to do is, is partly law in context, I guess, but also uh, partly political economy of law, whatever that means, because that has as many different versions as it has practitioners. Um, so I put my own on paper a couple of months ago, uh, open access actually, in the International Organization's Law Review last year. That will give you a little bit of, of a hint as to how I want to help approach this sort of thing. It's neither the law and economics version of political economy nor the Marxist version of political economy. It's something that probably takes elements of both um, because I tend to think that's better for what I want to know than putting myself firmly in one camp or another. That's not interesting. No one wants to know that, right? So there we are. That was two minutes, I guess. Yes, so perfect. Thank good you question, Peter. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Professor Klaber. Thank you very much, Professor Galindo and Professor Aziz for the interesting questions. Uh, we had many lessons this morning, but apparently another one is that you need, if you want to study international, uh, the law of international organizations, you have to learn French to pronounce the names of all the organizations. <laughs> so have a good lunch. We will be back here with Michele and Professor Mur uh, Sanchez Hatton and uh, Professor Morosini at 2.30. Have a good lunch and thank you very much. We can thank you, our panelists, with a round of applause.